Hey, it's Mike here, and today, the potato diet. What even is it? Is it actually as good for weight loss as people say? Is it nutritionally adequate as other people say? What is the best type of potato? Skins versus no skins. And hey, what about that scary acrylamide compound that you guys have been asking me to talk about for years? We're gonna look at all of it with the research, etc. Let's go. As you might already know, I'm a big proponent of whole starches. I'm gonna have a video all about us being starchivores talking about human history. But that's besides the point. It's pretty clear that I'm in support of many aspects of this diet. It's a vegan diet, it's around those whole starches. However, I still think it's worth analyzing this, analyzing the claims around it, see what's valid, if there are any concerns, do some pros and cons, all that good stuff. There's no denying that people have successfully lost weight on this diet. I mean, the poster child of the potato diet is High Carb Hannah, who I'll probably use for the thumbnail of this video because of that. She lost 70 pounds on a potato cleanse, potato diet. There's also Spud Fit, who lost like 114 pounds. Heck, even after Actor Kevin Smith lost some weight on this diet after he had a heart attack. And then there's YouTubers, really nice people like Potato Wisdom and her Potato Reset and Potato Strong, the OG potato dude working out. And I can't forget this dude named Chris from the Washington State Potato Commission who, just to show that these carbs are not gonna automatically make you fat, went on a completely potato diet for two months. He lost weight as well. But what pushed me over the edge to make this video was when I recently mentioned the paper that looked at various commonly consumed foods and how satiating they were per calorie. And boiled potatoes landed in at number one. Sadly, boiled or fresh potato consumption in the US has gone down by about 50% as French fries and other fried potato dishes have increased. And now as 40% of the US adults are obese, maybe it's time to get the potato diet going. Anyway, let's look to some pretty interesting potato history or facts. First of all, a lot of people just think that they are automatically from Ireland. Yes, they've been fueling Ireland for a while, doing good things over there. But as many of you already know, they originate in South America. Yes, most of the 4,000 varieties of potatoes originated in South America where they were brought down from space by the Anunnaki in 20,000 BC. <laughs> no, I'm not saying it's aliens, but it's potato aliens. I'm totally joking, but speaking of space, their nutritional prowess has earned them a space on the spaceship, you can find articles by NASA saying, space buds to the rescue, or just articles showing that NASA wants to grow potatoes on Mars. Yes, you're probably thinking Matt Damon and the movie Martian where he was growing and surviving off potatoes on Mars. If there's a reason it's potatoes and not steak, that's a topic for another video, but the nutritional profile we're gonna go deep into in a second, but there's one pretty major distinction about potato diets in general that needs to be made, and that is that there's more or less two different major cutoffs. One is where somebody experimentally eats all potatoes are virtually all potatoes. And then the other diet where it's a potato center diet that also includes other vegetables and maybe a little bit of berries and things like that. You know, the extreme version was a topic of a 1925 study on a couple people and protein balance. We'll get into those details in a bit. It's also worth mentioning that the one who went the longest was Spud Fit, who ate only potatoes, nothing else for an entire year. But the more widespread version, the more available version, you know, sometimes called the potato cleanse is summed up here by one simple vegan. Here are the rules allowed. Any spices, dried or fresh, you know, a couple tablespoons of sugar and maple syrup. So a lot of people are doing that. And then any non-starchy vegetables, you're talking salad, greens, zucchini, broccoli, all those, all those vegetables, oil-free, fat-free sauces, the whole point to not get too many calories from other places, water and tea, not allowed. Other starchy foods like corn, beans, rice, and grains, fruit, because again, main source of calories is supposed to be potatoes, and caffeine should be avoided for whatever reason. So really it's people making up their own versions of it, but it more or less fits into this vegan, whole food, more limited, more restricted diet. And we'll talk about the restriction in a little bit. I'm sorry, I feel like I just keep on talking about how we're gonna talk about stuff, but we'll get there. One thing is for sure though, like the main going recommendation for vegan diets, it still stands that people should be taking B12 while doing this diet anyway. Now, what would that potato diet actually look like? It's gonna be modifications of some classic dishes. You know, we're talking baked potatoes with veggies and sauces, potato salad, baked hash browns, baked fries, shepherd's pie, mashed potatoes, potato leek soup, and other soups. Love me some potato leek soup. Now that you know the basics, let's see what evidence, if any, exists to support the weight loss aspect of the potato diet. Well, we have these pretty amazing anecdotes, but that exists for 
virtually any diet. No, there seems to be somebody who found a way to lose weight on any diet. I mean, this dude lost 37 pounds eating only McDonald's, which contrasts sharply with supersize me. And that can be done with a focused strategy to lower calorie consumption, but the main advantage here is that you can more or less eat as many potatoes as you can comfortably fit in and still be hitting that calorie deficit, or at least eating the amount of calories that someone with excess weight will result in shedding weight from. So beyond the very impressive anecdotes, it doesn't appear that we have any randomized clinical trials comparing an actual potato diet versus other diets. However, we have something that is at least very close in terms of the nutrient profile of the diet and the eating habits of the diet in terms of not restricting calories. And that is the Broad Study. Yes, I'm mentioning it again out of New Zealand. You already probably know it's that whole starch, whole food, vegan diet that led to, as the researchers say, the greatest weight loss at six and 12 months of any diet that they were aware of that did not limit calories or add exercise. However, they did include other whole grains and they had legumes in there, et cetera, and the potato diet doesn't. But again, if you're looking at these foods, what they do in terms of your metabolism, they have a very similar profile. The potato diet might just help people limit consumption in some way. But the Broad Study researchers cite that higher water and fiber content of the diet leading to more satiation and less calories consumed, therefore more calories burned and fat loss. Now combine that study with how, again, potatoes are number one when they're boiled in terms of satiation per calorie. So there's a pretty decent scientific basis for a weight loss claim here. And I do wanna go over to that potato commission guy and his quote, because it's just pretty great. So again, this guy ate nothing but potatoes for two months you know, to dispel some myths about carb fear in general. And when he was asked, any surprises along the way, he said, I was kind of hoping to be alive at the end of the 60 days, but actually I got healthier. I wasn't trying to lose weight, but I lost 21 pounds, so that's over 10 pounds a month, though I was eating 2,200 calories of potatoes a day. My cholesterol went down 67 points, my blood sugar came down, and all the other blood chemistry, the iron, the calcium, the protein, all of those either stayed the same or got better. So that's pretty impressive, and it's of course worth noting in terms of blood sugar that you're eating a potato that is a complex carbohydrate, long chain carbs with a lot of fiber for that slow release of any sugars as your body digests that complex carb. And that cholesterol drop is pretty insane and amazing, so he's way better off for that. But getting to the nutritional adequacy of this, this brings me of course over to chronometer as I always go, and, and it's just interesting to look at 2000 calories of potatoes, which is really the energy source that people are getting here. And this is where it becomes very obvious that it's good to be eating the skins, maybe not every skin on every potato, but to be including them in a large quantity if you're doing this, because you know, no skins versus skins, 2000 calories of potatoes. With skins, you're talking 500% of daily iron. With no skins, you're talking 90%. So, you know, five-fold difference in some minerals. And it goes without saying that if you are eating the potato diet, like most people are, you're eating other vegetables that have other minerals and other vitamins. But we're looking at this just to get a baseline of the diet. And I'd be lying if I didn't highlight some of the pretty major nutritional gaps here. I mean, you're talking not enough vitamin A, you know, virtually no selenium or vitamin E. And in terms of fat, obviously you're getting no cholesterol and very, very low saturated fat. So those are benefits, but then you also have to be looking at omegas. And this is where these unique type of diets create unique potential concerns. For example, virtually nobody in the Western world or recent history has had to worry about getting enough omega sixes, but there's a case to be made here based off zero <laughs> omega six consumption uh, that, you know, maybe you're not actually meeting your minimum needs here, especially for, say, a reproductive female. Reproductive age female? That sounded kind of weird. No, and omega-6s are essential fats. You can't just be like, I'm never going to eat those again, which again comes down to the time span that you're doing this diet. So short term, yeah, probably okay. You probably got a lot of omega-6s up in there. Anybody does. And those omega-3s super low as well. So it's so not to say for sure the recommendation that many plant-based doctors have made to supplement DHA, those long chain omegas still stands here. And then of course we get to talk about a topic I'm generally not that concerned about, which is protein. But here, 2000 calories of these potatoes is only hitting 40 grams of protein. And yeah, the average man needs more calories, so they'll get a little bit more protein than that. But that is not even meeting the minimum recommended amount for women, which is 45 grams a day. And you actually have to get 
significantly higher, up to about 2,700 calories a day of potatoes to reach 56, which is a recommended amount for men. And that brings me to that extreme potato diet of 1925, which I'll be honest, you don't hear this when people talk about it, but they also gave them things like animal fat, which changes the equation a little bit in terms of their outcome. It was also only six months long, but it was mainly on nitrogen balance. Protein balance is more protein, nitrogen leaving your body than you're taking in through your diet. And they found, based off these two people in their 20s, in the 1920s, that their nitrogen balance was fine. I can't just call this the Yukon golden ticket to saying that a long-term potato only diet is good. I mean, again, two people, we don't know what would have happened past six months. Also, older people who might be drawn to this diet can have a little bit more problem synthesizing protein into muscle. So that lower than recommended amount of protein intake just doesn't have any advantage. It only has disadvantages, especially when you consider higher survival rate for elderly people with higher muscle mass. But other than these nutrients, it's pretty impressive how much is in a potato when you're getting up to around 2000 calories. One other concern I had was, I thought maybe someone will be like, oh, I, I actually just like sweet potatoes. So I'm gonna ditch the white potatoes and just do sweet potatoes. And that could have created more nutritional gaps. But looking at 2000 calories of that, pretty impressive as well. Yeah, you're falling a little bit behind on stuff like zinc, but again, when you're adding other foods in, you're doing better. But for me, I would probably be adding some legumes, even a few hundred calories of legumes is going to really pump that protein up to the recommended daily amount, which I think people can agree should be met. And then really quickly, if we're talking about the best potato when looking at the most common choice between red and gold or yellow, you know, yellow appears to have a higher calorie content, russet does as well, and uh, higher minerals like iron and calcium. But red is a little bit better for those antioxidants because that's what makes the outside red. All right, now let's move right along to that acrylamide stuff that many of you have been concerned about and asked me to do a video on. I figured I'd just fit it all right in here. And it is, you know, a probable carcinogen, a low level carcinogen, we'll get to that in a bit, but it is created as potatoes and some other foods are browned. It's actually the Maillard reaction of sugars and proteins and heat that creates the acrylamide. In particular, the reaction turns the non-essential amino acid asparagine, like asparagus, into acrylamide. In terms of practical health risk, as this Harvard Heart letter mentions, looking at the epidemiology, there doesn't really appear to be a connection, unless you're looking at smoking where people get blasted with acrylamide. So that's worth noting. However, what if there's a diet where people decide to base everything off potatoes and they maybe have a penchant for grilling or baking or broiling those potatoes into a fine dark brown wedge? So from that perspective, maybe it's worth thinking about mitigating this just to be safe. I don't want people to be like afraid of potatoes. Like we don't need more food fear in the world, but we at least need to address this real quick. So the amount of acrylamide will basically be directly correlated with the amount of brown surface area that exists in the food. So of course, cutting larger wedges is better. Whole baked potatoes are gonna have very low exposed surface area. But then of course, chopping those little mini highly browned wedges as delicious as they are, is probably not the best idea. And of course, boiling potatoes will have absolutely none because this process happens around 235 degrees. And at that point, the water would evaporate. So to keep things boiling, uh, obviously it's not gonna reach that temperature. And another little fact, if you are refrigerating your potatoes, they can sort of sweat out sugar, which then increases the amount of acrylamide that can be created. So just probably don't do that. It's a waste of space anyway. But there's some good news in that there might be several ways to lower acrylamide, some of which can be done easily at home. The industry has been aware of this, and so they've come up with an enzyme, asparaginase, which of course breaks down that asparagine into an acid instead of letting it turn into acrylamide. And it appears that lowers acrylamide by about 90%. But for a more home-friendly solution, pun not intended, because when I wrote down that note, I didn't realize it was a pun, uh, you can apparently pre-dip them in a salt water solution, and that can lower the acrylamide by 78%. They call it a 2% sodium chloride dip pre-treatment for 60 minutes. But if you don't want that added sodium, there could be some other solutions, like using rosemary, Putting rosemary in the oil that you then fry potatoes in lowers it. And I imagine if you do the same sort of water spice mixing that I and a lot of other people do, you're gonna get that contact that 
you need between those rosemary compounds to also lower it by 60%. It also appears that green tea lowers the acrylamide, but that just seems like a lot of work to brew tea every time you're making potatoes. Interestingly, extra virgin olive oil increases the amount of acrylamide is one more reason that extra virgin olive oil isn't all it's cracked up to be. So while acrylamide might not even be a major concern, there are many ways to mitigate it. You could be eating potatoes all day long without getting an ounce of acrylamide if you wanted to. Anyway, there's one last thing I thought is just worth mentioning to be sensitive to people who might be at risk of eating disorders. This is a more restrictive diet, and I can see it sort of fostering somebody's eating disorder. Again, that list of foods you're not supposed to eat is even longer than a normal vegan diet, and it's also cutting out foods that you really have no health reason to cut out, you know, like legumes, which are the most associated with longevity of any food in elderly populations. So there's literally no reason to be cutting that out. So if I ever needed to do this for weight loss for any reason, I would be making my own brand of the potato diet that would include legumes and probably a few more foods and omegas that there just isn't a risk of preventing the weight loss from happening because it is worth mentioning as well that lowering your weight from a more disease promoting weight is healthier. It's hard to address this topic and get everything psychologically in the right place to make it happen so everything is positive. So I would just put up a little cost in that area, but in the end, <laughs> I would just end up morphing it into a whole food vegan diet anyway. But for pros and cons of the actual potato diet itself, why not? We have the pretty well-backed weight loss aspect with the mechanism behind it, with potatoes being a highly satiating food. You're also getting to eat as much as you feel like you need to eat, which is huge for a weight loss diet. And it's also very cheap, you know, compare this to something like the carnivore diet, which I didn't even waste my time doing. And uh, you're coming out way ahead with the potato diet. And as a vegan, I almost forget adding uh, no cholesterol and it's gonna probably lower your cholesterol like by that guy who lowered his cholesterol by 67 points. Cons though, I mean, the main one is that long-term it doesn't appear to be super well balanced. You're missing a few things in the fat that area especially, and some of the minerals if you're not careful. Of course there are cons, like you're not gonna be able to go to restaurants, it's gonna be socially a little bit harder eating. Although who doesn't like a big potato salad brought to the potluck, which those don't even exist anymore because of uh, a little thing called Lorona. So we can forget about that. Anyway, you also have the acrylamide concern, which can be nipped in the butt entirely. And finally, I would just put up that little caution sign for people who might be at risk of an eating disorder. All right, that's it for today. Potatoes are pretty awesome from Peru all the way to Mars and beyond, courtesy of the Anunnaki. Some kind of potato-like spacecraft landed clearly in these hieroglyphs. Also, I have my potato U tank, which I wear all the time. It's my favorite. It'll be in the description. Feel free to like and subscribe, you spud you.